Very long uh, introduction, actually. Uh, no, I feel uh, under so much stress. I hope I'll be up to this uh, introduction. Uh, so thank you very much, and please give me the chance to th welcome Dr. Jan Ekstran and thank uh, Dr. Scott for his great uh, contribution for the for Aspitar. Uh, so lumbar spondylolisthesis uh, it's actually a very common uh, problem. And actually, uh, it's mainly managed by you guys, by the physiotherapist, by the uh, uh, team doctors, uh, by the uh, primary healthcare uh, physicians. Uh, it is, uh, you have to understand uh, the, uh, why this happened. Uh, those young athletes, uh, they have a higher incidence of paracenter articularis fracture than the general population. They have an immature spine which goes through a uh, huge uh, stress uh, during their physical activities. Uh, stress fracture uh, in the pars can develop at any age. It is mostly common uh, during childhood or adolescence. And it's usually six to eight percent of the uh, population. And in the general population, again, it's around six to eight uh, percent. However, the percentage can be much higher uh, can rise up to 63% in some uh, aggressive sport activities. Uh, spondylolysis also uh, increases with age until you reach adulthood, and then usually the chances of getting it goes uh, lower, but still you can get it. Uh, you know, the famous fracture of uh, Neymar, actually, he, have, he had it as an adult. Uh, it's more common in males than females. Uh, with a ratio of uh, 2 to 1. The mechanism of injury can, as I said, happen due to uh, uh, acute trauma or mostly due to repetitive hyperextension in athletes, which results in uh, weakening uh, of the uh, already weak bone, the, the mature bone, uh, until it's fractured. Also, it can be as a result of a wrong uh, positioning while doing sports. Um, I tried actually to simplify the, the, the uh, lecture or simplify the subject as we have a mixed uh, audience. The uh, pars interarticularis it means the connection between uh, two uh, joints. And uh, you can see here, uh, is there a laser I could use? Laser pointer, you see, okay. So this is uh, a facet joint here, and there's another facet joint, and the porous is the piece that connects them. Again, you see a porous, uh, you see a facet joint here, facet joint here, and the, this is the porous, this is the porous. On an x-ray, you can see it clearly, we'll talk, we'll explain how. There's very important terminology for you to understand, because you will keep hearing it and you might get confused. Spondylolysis, spondylolisthesis, and spondylosis. Spondylosis uh, means the generation of the spine, which we, you know, in this hospital, we, sh we shouldn't see a lot of it since we are a sports hospital, but we still see a lot. Spondylolysis is a defect in the bone, uh, and it can, uh, spondylolysis defines uh, any, any part of the spine, but it usually occurs in the pars because it is the uh, area where the most stress happens. Uh, the uh, stress fracture can result in back pain. Uh, this can progress further to instability. When instability occurs, it's usually referred to as spondylolisthesis. Uh, it also needs to be differentiated from degenerative spondylolisthesis, which usually happens in the adult, and there's an easy way to differentiate it on X-ray. I'll mention it for you. So again, just to to to, uh, to differentiate, this is the normal pars. When the stress fracture occurs, it is spondylolysis. The lysis of the there's a lytic lesion, and when there is a slip, it progresses to spondylolisthesis. Uh, spondylis spondylolysis is usually a self-limiting uh, condition and uh, you know, it heals within 6 to 12 weeks. Um, <coughs> Non-surgical treatments are usually 
successful most of the time. Whereas spondylolisthesis it can occur in four to six percent, uh, is seen in four to six percent of the general population, actually six to eight percent. This is, uh, uh, and this usually occurs at the L5 S1 level, uh, mostly 82 percent at the L5 S1 level, 11 percent at the L4 5 level. There is many ways to classify it. Uh, the most, uh, this is a classification uh, commonly used. It's according to the pathology. So type one is dysplastic, type two is ismic, uh, type three degenerative, type four is traumatic, type five is pathologic, possibly due to a tumor. There is the Myerding classification. So uh, Myerding classify, classified it according to the amount of slip. If it's uh, zero to 25 percent, it's grade one more than 25 to 50 is uh, grade two, uh, more than 75% grade three, and more than 100% is uh, grade four. And when there is ptosis of the, or complete dislocation, we call spondylotosis, it is grade five. <coughs> uh, there is c certain predictors for the slip progression, which includes female gender. Uh, if the injury happened pre pubescence the shape of the uh, L5 uh, vertebra, if it's a trapezoidal shape, the shape of the sacrum, if it's doomed, uh, doomed and vertical sacrum are usually more prone to progression, or if the slip angle is more than 10 degrees. Uh, also with higher uh, grades of slip, they are more likely to progress. Uh, there is a way to uh, measure the slip angle, uh, usually take a line across the superior end plate and the line uh, at the posterior border of the, of the body of the sacrum, and you measure this angle. And it represents a local kyphosis at the L5-S1 motion segment. So diagnosis uh, is through a careful clinical examination uh, and a careful history. Many of those patients, actually, they go undiagnosed. They develop a bit of back pain, they go to the primary health care, pres prescribe some medication, and they, they heal. Uh, so high index of suspicion uh, should be there. You need to do x-rays, uh, including oblique x-rays, CT scans. Uh, they are especially important when there is a unilateral porous defect. Flexion extension x-rays to assess instability and uh, MRI scan and bone scan. So this is what you see on an X-ray. Uh, you can actually, if you if you draw a line on the posterior border, the li you will see the li the line has broken. There's another X-ray to demonstrate it. But here I want to show you. This is the oblique view, and we call this the Scotty dog appearance. So this is the Scotty dog, and this is uh, the head of the dog, and this area is the pars. And when there is a fracture, you will see the, that this neck is broken. <coughs> Again, these are the lines which you draw on the lateral X-ray. And you can see clearly here that this line is broken, which signifies uh, a grade one instability. Uh, again, the oblique X-rays, you can see it here clearly that the pars, the, the, uh, Parsis fracture, or there is a lytic lesion. Dynamic flexion extension X-rays, they are extremely important. Actually, I've been having trouble with Dr. Ahmad is here. Dr. Ahmad is not here. Uh, the, they had difficulty actually initially request uh, doing them initially here in the radiology department, which shows that they were not doing it before. They are actually provide a significant amount of information when there is uh, uh, instability. Uh, so they are very important. CT scan, it's very good to, to define the, the bony anatomy. If there is a unilateral fracture, it can really show it. Uh, and it's also good for preoperative evaluation. The MRI scan, uh, you can see uh, the, the bony edema, which signifies if this is acute or uh, chronic. However, uh, 
Some people, they like to repeat the MRI six weeks later before, uh, like asking, the, uh, allowing the patient to return to play. I'm not sure that this is really required. Uh, I think it's an overuse of MRIs. Uh, you should go by your clinical judgment more than the, than the uh, with, with your experience, Dr. Scott, do you think repeating the MRI is important or? It would, it would never be no. So another uh, useful tool uh, is the bone scan also. Sometimes the lysis is not seen. So you just do a bone scan and you will see an increased uptake at the uh, porous, which signifies that there is a fracture there. So there are certain steps of management. Phase one is with the ni nice guys, uh, Kiron and uh, the primary healthcare and all the nice guys. And then phase two, you go with the nasty guys, a bit nasty, not very nasty, like, uh, you know, they give injections. And phase three is the nastiest to fall, you know, the surgeon. So you, you, and you thank God, only five to 10% of your patients will reach the surgeons and 90% will not need surgery. So with phase one, it involves activity restriction. Uh, bracing is controversial. I like to give it to patients, gives them uh, a sense that there is something wrong it makes them more careful, more care cautious, they take things seriously, but it's not really a must. Uh, physical therapy is extremely important. Uh, it's actually uh, the mainstay of treatment because uh, many studies have showed that ag aggressive, uh, or not aggressive, I mean uh, well-structured training uh, programs will definitely uh, take care of uh, the problem and the patient will uh, improve. Uh, they usually compromise of core and back strengthening exercise, uh, flexible and hamstring stretching, and you should remember to avoid uh, extension. Very important to avoid extension. Oral medications, uh, non-steroidals, anti-inflammatories, and muscle relaxants. Some people give steroids. Uh, I don't like to give it, actually, but you know, sometimes you, I see some, some surgeons, they, they like to give it if they want a rapid improvement of, uh, it will not affect the outcome, but it can be used as pain management. Uh, of course, I uh, cold and hot compressions, and you guys uh, know better than me actually in this phase. Uh, this is a paper uh, which showed that uh, well-structured physiotherapy program uh, showed a great, uh, so it was actually published in 97, it showed that, that the patient mostly improved after a, a well-structured physiotherapy program. Since then, this has become actually the main stay of treatment. Uh, this paper was given to me by, by Kiron. It was published when I was 17 years old. So it must be, uh, it must be good. So this is the core stability exercises Flexion uh, exercises to relieve the sciatic uh, nerve. Again, the braces, as I said, it's controversial, but I think it's giving it as a good idea for the patient. So you here, when you step up the treatment, when those treatment fails, you start with giving the patient uh, steroid injections, which can actually uh, relieve the patient and allow him to maybe return to play uh, earlier and it can be repeated if required up to three injections. When all those measures fail, you move on, move on to the uh, aggressive, uh, or sorry, for more invasive uh, procedures. Along the history, there has been many surgical procedures which have been developed. Uh, there is uh, the most uh, effective one is the defect uh, repair, but uh, also there has been many options like laminectomy, but this has been abandoned because it destabilizes the spine. Uh, posterior lateral fusion might be a good option in some cases, but you have to remember that when you fuse a motion segment, the patient will lose some of his range of motion and it will affect his uh, sport uh, career. Uh, uh, anterior and posterior fusion might be used in some difficult cases, advanced uh, slip, uh, again, it's, uh, it's a very aggressive procedure, but sometimes you need to do it. 
Return to play is a difficult question. I really, uh, there is no uh, clear guidelines about the patient, but the general rule is when the patient is uh, asymptomatic uh, and he's able to go on with his daily routines, you can allow him to go back slowly. Uh, uh, however, it's good to know that the majority of patients will go back to f their uh, full uh, f physical activities. Uh, this is a, a meta-analysis which showed that 92% of patients treated non-operatively uh, went back to full uh, sporting activities well, and 90% of patients with surgery also went back to full exit. So actually it's, uh, it's good to know that most of the patients will go back. Uh, some of the surgical options that I have mentioned, uh, this is a, a way to repair uh, by using a hook around the lamina and you put a screw across the, the, the fracture to, uh, to cause compression. It's usually uh, used for younger patients and has a good outcome. This is the classical uh, procedure which was described by Buck in the 1970s. You put a screw across the uh, uh, pars. This is the regular pars if you can appreciate it. And you just put a screw and compresses the fracture another cut showing the, the here was the fracture and it, it has healed. Uh, there has been many uh, modifications. Uh, the, now the trend is with minimally invasive approach, especially that we can approach the spine with the uh, navigation and uh, we can go through a much smaller uh, wound. Uh, so this is actually a way to do it through a min minimally invasive approach. Uh, using uh, percutaneous wires and then you can compress the, the spine. This is the final outcome. And studies have showed that uh, uh, minimally invasive uh, options show an earlier return to, uh, to play. However, the long-term outcome is the same. Uh, but it makes sense but the, the, to go for a minimally invasive because there is less uh, tissue damage, less bleeding. Uh, so it's, it is the future and should become the standard of care. So the important points to remember, uh, spondylolysis is a common cause of back pain in general uh, and specifically in athletes. Non-operative treatment is the mainstay of treatment. Uh, strict physiotherapy programs the most successful modality of treatment. Avoid, remember to avoid hyperextension. Also, you need to give the patient general advice about proper positioning. Uh, return to play, I just want to read this because this is, I think it's, it's an important uh, thing to, to realize. An inherent drive for return to competition, pressure from coaches and family, and oblig obligations to the team can confound the decision making on both part of the patient and the treating physician. Although this motivation for a prompt return to sport must certainly be considered, a safe return to competition is paramount. So we should always have this balance between the safety of our patients and the early return to play. So this is a picture actually of my son uh, before one of the races. He was very stressed out you know, conf uh, I wouldn't say confused, but he was uh, under so much stress. The kids, when they, or the young athletes, when they have similar problem, I actually managed one patient, they go through the same. They're under so much stress, and you go through th so much stress because you have the, the parents or the coach with him. So it's very important that you give him uh, support, reassurance, and with the proper treatment plan, most patients will be happy. Thank you.